welcome back. This is Wesley Shantz and at Signum Academy for our second meeting of January. We're going to be looking at Rosemary Sutcliffe and Beowulf. I've got a lot of interesting stuff to share with you all this time. Uh, first off, again, Signum Academy. We're doing something a little different this year, looking at uh, three main authors, um, Rosemary Sutcliffe in the spring, Ellen Montgomery in the summer, Tova Janssen in the fall. Uh, so we started by looking at uh, Tolkien and Lewis, Madeline Langell and J.K. Rowling. Um, we moved into some fairy tales and the works of Philip Pullman. And now maybe you can see there's kind of a theme this year. Um, it is authors who are women and they tend to be a bit historical in their outlook. Um, the, uh, uh, the most recent author on here, I suppose, is probably um, Tovi Janssen. Um, but uh, Rosemary Sutcliffe also uh, grew up in the same, roughly the same time period. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about her life again today. I was, I was reading up on it. Uh, I think that would be this slide I wanted to show you all first. Um, this autobiography memoir um, of her childhood. Um, so I, I read up on this and I found something really interesting. Um, there's, a, there's a point in the story where she's uh, at a library and the library is very segregated. Um, there's books for boys and those are the good books and then there's books for girls and she's not really interested in those books. But then she says, and then one day I found a book. It was a book called Emily of New Moon. What made it so different from other books of its kind? I did not know and I do not really know even now. But for me, it was magic. Am I not cat? Am I? Sorry. My cat is really loud. Um, so it's a magic book for her. Emily of New Moon. Well, looky here. That happens to be one of the books by Ellen Montgomery that we're going to be reading. Um, so here's the updated uh, schedule on our Signum uh, Academy website. Um, if you scroll down at the bottom here, you'll see we're looking at Beowulf. Uh, then we're going to look at some King Arthur stories, all Rosemary Sutcliffe. And then in the Ellen Montgomery uh, months, we'll start with Anne of Green Gables, probably her most famous book. Um, actually, the only book of hers that I've ever read. Uh, and then we're going to actually look at this Emily trilogy, starting with Emily of New Moon, this book that um, captivated Rosemary Sutcliffe. So this is just another kind of cool little example of the ways that these authors are all connected. Um, in this case, again, kind of a historical connection. Um, but of course, there's also some important themes and ideas that, that connect these authors as well. Um, now, if y'all had some favorite parts of Beowulf, Please go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, I know it might be a little different looking for you. That's what it looks like on my end. Uh, it's nothing much to look at, so I'll try to check in there from time to time um, to see if anyone's posted anything. But um, I thought maybe we could just kind of go through the book, uh, jumping around a little bit. But uh, there are a few things in particular I wanted to share and and talk about a little bit. Um, last time we gave kind of an overview of the book as a whole, um, talked a bit about Rosemary Sutcliffe and um, about some of the main events of this story. And the way her retelling works is in these short chapters. Um, they're loosely structured the way um, that the original text uh, is, is based. We have a journey, uh, we have an arrival at the hall, a battle with Grendel, 
and then some celebrations. Grendel's mother coming in, another battle, more celebrating, time passes, and then the dragon. And then the dragon is the end, uh, essentially. The, uh, the rough structure there is um, kind of these spikes and, and valleys of action and relaxation. Um, you might recognize this structure. Uh, it's very similar, I think, uh, to the way that Tolkien writes The Hobbit uh, and The Lord of the Rings to an extent, where he'll have a chapter of kind of more adventurous stuff happening and then followed by a chapter of more kind of uh, tranquility, wonder, seeing something amazing, meeting somebody new. Um, so, as we mentioned, I think, last time, Tolkien really loved this book, Beowulf, um, and has his own translation and retelling of it. Um, and I thought maybe we could start out by just, just looking at the opening of these two versions of the story. Um, they're quite different. Uh, so Tolkien's version, I'm just looking at it on Amazon here. I hope that makes it easy for you guys to see. Um, Tolkien's version starts out and sticks really close to the original. Lo, the glory of the kings of the people of the Spear Danes in days of old we have heard tell how those princes did deeds of valor. Oft shield shaving robbed the hosts of foemen, many peoples, of the seats where they drank the mead, laid fear upon men, he who first was found forlorn, comfort for that he lived to know, mighty grew under heaven, throve in honor, until all that dwelt nigh about, over the sea where the whale rides, must hearken to him, and yield him tribute. A good king was he. <laughs> so that last little passage there, that was a good king, is literally probably the uh, easiest part of the whole book to understand uh, from the old English to our modern English. It sounds really similar. Um, so the original story opens with someone who's not Beowulf at all, but this mythical figure of shield shaving a good king. Uh, he has some descendants, and then we come to Hrothgar uh, and his beautiful hall. Um, the word of this hall spreads to all the lands around, uh, and a spirit of malice, the monster Grendel comes and takes over. Uh, so in Rosemary Sutcliffe's version, we actually start with a story. We're in uh, Geatland and some visitors have come um, in the great hall of Kigalak, king of the Geats, supper was over and the mead horns going round. So it was the time of evening, with the dusk gathering beyond the firelight, when the warriors called for Anjelm, the king's bard, to wake his heart for their amusement. But tonight they had something else to listen to than the half-sung, half-told stories of ancient heroes that they knew by heart. Tonight there were strangers in their midst, seafarers with the salt still in their hair, from the first trading ship to reach them since the ice melted and the wild geese came north again. So her version of the story zooms in on a story um, but it immediately jumps to the amazing hall uh, of Hrothgar the terror of Grendel the night stalker Grendel the man wolf the death shadow um, so her version really uh, brings us straight to the point uh, in a way that the original story really doesn't um, and there's all kinds of weird and historical stuff going on uh, in the original version but I really don't think you lose much uh, by missing the bit about shield chafing um, and I think she's maybe making kind of a joke here by talking about the half sung half told stories of ancient heroes that they knew by heart um, the story of shield shaving would be an example of that probably um, but she, she's not mentioning him here. So I think that's a really cool way to immediately kind of 
put her stamp on the story where uh, Sutcliffe decides to really change the opening entirely. Um, I think I mentioned last time how Tolkien would read the, uh, recite, you know, proclaim the opening in Old English at the start of all his classes. Uh, and he would just shout it um, as he walked into the room. Um, that doesn't really work with her version, though. Um, it, it really kind of draws you in in a different way. It's not hitting you over the head for your attention. It's got this kind of a quality of bringing us into a story. Um, and then we gradually come to meet our hero, Beowulf. Um, so the image here, I think, is a really nice one for showing this happening. Uh, all of the people in the hall kind of mesmerized by the story. All right. I've got some more pictures um, besides the one from last time of the Coast Guard, the warden, uh, watching the ship approach and wondering, you know, are these attackers, are these friends? Um, there's a really great picture here of Beowulf and Unferth or Hunferth, as Rosemary Sutcliffe gives his name. Um, so as Beowulf goes on his journey, arrives in Denmark, comes up to the hall, and there's this interesting kind of um, confrontation that we have. Uh, this is really the first time we see Beowulf in action. Um, and it's a, f it's a battle of words. So this character, Hunferth, his job, as Rosemary Sutcliffe describes it, he's the jester. So let, let me find her version of the story here. Um, the king's jester, she calls him. Um, and his role is really to challenge anyone who comes to, uh, any visitors, any guests who come, who might uh, be a threat Again, um, they're not attacking, but Beowulf and his men are these kind of uh, heroic figures. And so it doesn't really look good for the king if he's not the most impressive person in the hall. Right? This is his territory. This is his house. Um, so Unferth, or Hunferth, the king's speechmaker and jester, uh, his job is to throw out shade <laughs> basically to to stir up uh, uh, any visitors and so the way he does this with Beowulf is to say tell us are you that Beowulf of whom we heard who strove with Breca son of Beanstan in a wondrous contest upon the winter sea um, and so I think it's really important to think about the way that he's saying this um, that could sound kind of friendly, um, but we're told he's got these bitter-tongued, envious, fierce-tempered ways of speaking. He speaks coolly and jibingly, jokingly, um, not very friendly. And that's really what his name means, uh, basically unfirth. Um, he is an unfriendly person. Uh, you might remember a similar character again in Tolkien in the two towers we have the character of Grima Wormtongue uh, and his he's a, a bit more evil uh, a bit more twisted even than uh, Unferth but he's got a kind of a similar role as the king's counselor um, challenging in guests so um, Beowulf has to stand up for himself here and he does this by again telling the story he tells the story of what really happened uh, in this contest on the waters um, so Unferth has essentially told a lie uh, called him a loser and Beowulf explains what really happened um, was that they were separated in their uh, their hunting expedition. The storm arose and drove our boats apart. Um, 
and he kills the walrus. Uh, he survives out on the on the open ocean, and only learns later that Brekka washed up somewhere else. Um, that he didn't kill the walrus, right? Uh, so there's again, it looked kind of like there's maybe some uh, older folk tales that are getting adapted into this story here. Um, this is one that Rosemary Sutcliffe keeps in her story. She leaves out the bit about the old king, but she keeps in the story about Beowulf and Brekka, um, their swimming match, essentially, uh, makes it into a, a hunting match. Um, and the effect, I think, is important. So there's the picture that I pulled out for our slide. Um, you can see it maybe a little more clearly here. Um, Beowulf and Unferth, he's putting the king's jester in his place, um, not in a threatening way necessarily, um, but just letting him know who's boss here. Um, so again, it's kind of one of the first bits of action that we see, see from Beowulf, um, and it's in the course of his own story about what happened. Um, so clearly uh, storytelling and the ability to tell a good story is really important um, in these old books uh, in Beowulf in uh, Tolkien and uh, of course in, in stories like the Odyssey the Iliad um, someone was mentioning last time uh, Rosemary Sutcliffe has retellings of those too um, so Again, if you guys have any favorite parts that you really want to touch on here, if you've had a chance to read this version of Beowulf, or if you know the Beowulf story, and there's parts of it that you really want to discuss, uh, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, I thought it might be interesting to look at the uh, kind of the important consequence of this moment, which is where, as as the story progresses. Um, Beowulf, of course, defeats Grendel without using a weapon, uh, uses his bare hands. Um, we've got this awesome image here from uh, Charles Keeping, the illustrator of Beowulf, having wrenched the arm off of the creature who then uh, flees but is mortally wounded and, and dies. Um, they, they hold up the arm as a trophy. And this apparently enrages and invites in Grendel's mother. Grendel's mother then kills one of the most important counselors, Asher, or Asher, uh, of the king. And then the next battle uh, ensues from there, where the king, Beowulf, and his men go out hunting Grendel's mother uh, and find her in her lair. And um, at that point, we get Unferth um, making peace with Beowulf, essentially, uh, giving him a sword. Um, so here's that portion. Um, and we read this last time, the description of the, uh, the description of the cave uh, under the water where Grendel's mother is waiting. Um, but here's the interesting thing about uh, Unferth. Unferth the king's jester, bitter-tongued and flame-tempered, pulled the sword from his own wolf-skin sheath and came shouldering through the other warriors so, to thrust it half angrily into Beowulf's hand. Here, take my sword. Hunting, men call it. The blade was tempered with brew of poison twigs and hardened with battle blood. It is a powerful blade and has never yet failed its man in combat. So then we get this kind of memory of their fight, their, their war of war words the, the other night. Um, but Beowulf accepts the gift. He says, friend, I thank you for the loan. With hunting or surely not at all, I will overcome this wolf woman of the sea. Um, so there's kind of uh, an attempt here. They, they're trying to, to make friends, right? Um, and it becomes 
interesting uh, then that when Beowulf goes down into the lair and is fighting with all the monsters there, this weapon hunting, as strong as it is, uh, and poisonous and uh, hardened, it cannot harm Grendel's mother. Just like Grendel, she has a charmed uh, kind of armor on her, uh, of her body that is impenetrable. It's invincible to any weapons. Um, so hunting fails. And Beowulf has to improvise, essentially. Um, so although he defeats the, um, the son with his bare hands, to defeat the mother, he actually has to use a weapon. Okay. Some weapon he must have. And as he fought, he snatched desperate glances about him in search of one. Here and there, ancient weapons hung on the rock walls of the cavern, and amongst them, the light from the roof fell upon one sword, a huge sword, dwarf wrought, perhaps, for giants in far past days, for it was so long in the blade and broad in the grip that no mortal man, save Beowulf, could have wielded it. Seeing it, his heart leapt up with fresh hope, and gathering all his strength and cunning, he gave way before the sea hag's onslaught, then swerved and sprang sideways past her to snatch it from the wall. His hand closed over the hilt, and with a triumphant battle shout, he whirled around and brought the blade down upon her in a flashing swoop of fire. So, he uses this giant sword, uh, a sword made, perhaps, for giants, we're told, in far past days. Um, so this kind of magical sword uh, has, I think I mentioned this, has writing on it. Um, it's the only thing that can break the spell um, because it's magical itself. Um, the spell on the flesh of Grendel and his kin. But the blade is destroyed by her blood. So her blood is this kind of acid that eats into the blade melts away like ice in the warmth of a fire, so nothing was left but the wondrous gold-wrought hilt in his hand. So he brings back the head and the hilt, the broken bit of the sword, um, and uh, it's, I think it's kind of funny that um, the attempt, right, to, to make friends uh, is through lending this great sword, uh, the sword turns out to be useless, and instead Beowulf comes back with a different sword um, that uh, can show off and is kind of wonderful and magical. Um, I think this might indicate for us just how lonely Beowulf really is. Um, and I mean, the way that I'm thinking about this is the attempt to make friends um, is in these kind of contests. So he has a contest with Brekka, um, the swimming contest. And he has a contest with Unferth, where they're trading words. Um, Unferth tries to make friends by giving him the sword. The sword fails him. It, it doesn't work. And we see this over and over with, with Beowulf. He, um, he's almost too strong to use weapons. Um, but what I think we're also seeing here uh, is that he has to sort of do everything on his own. Um, this is the sort of the flip side of being this superhero, um, this super strong warrior, uh, is that he can do things no one else can do, but it also sets him apart. It makes him, in a way, um, a monster himself. So. This theme, it comes out in little ways. Um, he's using a weapon that wasn't meant for human beings to defeat this monster. Um, and the weapon he uses, even that I is destroyed. It's, it's not something that he can pass on or use again. Um, it's not going to serve him. And he certainly can't share it with anyone else. 
Um, so there's this kind of powerful sense of Beowulf's being different from other people, being in a way alone and u unique and special. Um, so I really think that this might be part of the reason that Rosemary Sutcliffe uh, is drawn to this story. Um, we talked last time about her uh, upbringing. Uh, so her dad's in the Navy and they kind of move around a lot, but she's also in the hospital a lot. She has uh, an illness as a child that um, leads to a, an arthritis. And uh, so she is um, not really around other kids very much. Um, she knows that she's sort of different and special. Um, she has a really complicated relationship with her parents, uh, especially her mom, it sounds like. Um, and again, if you read her memoir, you'll, you'll see this a lot more. Um, but she talks about especially how lonely she is, how she feels uh, separate, uh, apart from other people, and how she really has, has trouble talking about that with anyone. Um, so this might be part of what uh, she also sees in Emily of New Moon. Again, I don't know that story, um, but I certainly, from what I remember of Anne of Green Gables, if it's anything like that, there's this kind of unique quality to the, uh, the hero of these stories where they're, on the one hand, remarkable, exceptional people. On the other hand, sort of lonely, sort of... Um, in their own world a lot of the time. So that's, I think, part of why maybe um, she chooses to retell this Beowulf story and, and part of what makes it so powerful, uh, her version of the story, is um, the ways that that loneliness comes through. Um, the setting, of course, is important for that, uh, and we, we talked a bit about that last time. So sort of skipping ahead then to the yeah, lexical stress puts it this way, kind of like the curse of being a beautiful woman. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, I, I guess I don't know about that myself, but sounds about right. Um, in, um, in Tolkien, right, we have these kind of beautiful female characters who are almost unattainable, but not quite, right? Only great heroes um, can, uh, can get close to these elf maidens or half-elf uh, uh, female characters. Um, so yes, uh, there is a kind of loneliness there as well. Um, so there's uh, kind of a jump ahead in the story. Um, time passes here, and Beowulf, as, as a great king, uh, ends up facing his final uh, his final challenge, that is the dragon, of course. Um, so, when this time comes, he does have companions. Um, and the one to keep an eye on, I guess, is uh, Wiglaf, his kinsman. Um, they go with him to fight the dragon. But when the time comes, he tells them to wait behind. Um, he says that this is a fight for him alone. Um, and at this moment, he says, um, well, here's how she puts it. Sitting there, he felt weird touch him, like a shadow passing across the sun. He had been young and confident, glorying in his own strength when he fought his battle with Grendel, but now he was old and knew that this would be his last fight. And suddenly lifting his head as he began as the wild swans are said to do to sing his own death song. Um, so this idea of weird with a capital W, W-Y-R-D, uh, the same root as our word weird, uh, meaning sort of strange, but the meaning here is something like fate. He felt weird touching, he felt fate, uh, his fate, his death, what must happen. Um, and weird comes up 
a few times in the story, um, in the original story too, um, but particularly I think Rosemary Sutcliffe brings it out a little bit more, um, and she seems to downplay the other side of that which is a divine uh, plan. And so the Beowulf poet in the original version mentions uh, essentially different words for God. Um, so here's God sent him for the comfort of the people, the Lord of life who rules in glory. Um, and so there, there's a, a bunch of different places where we see God, the Christian God, um, brought in by the poet. The characters in the story, though, don't seem to be aware of Christianity yet. They're still in a pagan world. And so this is something that Tolkien really picked up on and was really interested in, is that kind of transition period between the older religions um, where the myth and the folklore are kind of mixed together. And then the poet uh, who's telling the story is most likely a monk or, or something like that um, and has an idea of the Christian God that he's sort of reading back into his material, his mythic material. So Rosemary Sutcliffe doesn't seem as interested in all of that. She doesn't really mention um, that aspect of the story much. She focuses on this idea of weird, this idea of fate, of that, um, that sense that warriors have, right? That they are perhaps doomed uh, in, in their last battles. Um, and this is something, she says that her mom thought that she had this kind of second sight um, and was sort of like weirdly disappointed when her dad didn't actually die in World War II. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, this, uh, this idea that Beowulf knows that this is his last fight, and yet he still won't bring anyone else with him. He wants to face the dragon alone. Um, this is kind of a problem. Um, it's kind of a, a pride, perhaps, coming through, a sense that um, that even as he's at the end of his his life, he still won't allow others to help him, um, and uh, it doesn't turn out well for his people, uh, to say the least. Um, this problem of Beowulf being unique and alone um, it carries on in the sense that he doesn't have a uh, descendant, um, an heir to the throne, uh, Wiglaf kind of takes on that role, but he's not really prepared for it. Um, Beowulf doesn't seem to have given much thought to what's going to come after him, um, and, and until it's too late. So this really ratchets up uh, the kind of the drama of this battle with the dragon. Um, the tragedy, the, the, the sadness of it, um, as Beowulf is in a way nobly, in a way proudly, um, protecting his people one last time. Um, so I found this other picture uh, from a later edition. And this is not the Rosemary Sutcliffe translation anymore, it's someone else's translation, but it's the same artist, the same illustrator. Uh, who does the ones in the Sutcliffe book. Um, it's got a much more sort of creepy feel to it, though. Especially this combination of these like wavy lines of the dragon and these very stark little broken trees of the, the devastation of the land below. Um, I thought this was a terrifying image uh, and one that I, I couldn't wait to share with you guys out there. Um, so of course there are tons of different versions of the story um, and tons of different artists uh, have also provided illustrations for it of different kinds. Um, but I, I really think that this 
Retelling by Rosemary Sutcliffe is a great way to at least um, get a feel for this world and these characters. Um, her descriptions of the setting, of the way the characters interact, um, and of course the battles are all really excellent. Um, the illustrations that go along with her book are wonderful uh, and really highlight some of the, the best moments of the story. Um, but then I do encourage you to go and read more. Um, if you like the Tolkien version, although it's kind of old fashioned, um, it's quite good. Uh, it's quite um, interesting to see how Tolkien is reading Beowulf. And that version uh, includes his notes and includes his own fairy tale kind of retelling of the story. Um, but then um, maybe read out other ones too. Uh, Seamus Haney, the Irish poet, has a really beautiful poetic translation. Um, and um, I guess this is the last image that I wanted to leave you guys with. Um, yeah. Unless there's other comments here. Um, so this image is that, again, that sense of a shadow passing over the sun, the way um, Sutcliffe puts it. Uh, Beowulf and his kinsmen um, have faced the dragon, have won, but also Beowulf has received his own death wound. Um, his, uh, his last request to see the treasure brought out and then to have it buried with him in a barrow, right, in a, in a grave high up above the sea. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting stuff uh, that we haven't had a lot of time to talk about here. I know just uh, kind of jumping around um, might not uh, be doing this book justice, but um, I did just want to um, uh, share some of the things I thought about uh, this book and of course I'm always interested in hearing from you if you guys have um, again favorite parts things that you thought were done really well um, you can find our website signumuniversity.org slash academy so search Signum Academy um, see what we're going to be looking at next time in February it's the King Arthur uh, the first book of the trilogy by Rosemary Sutcliffe The Sword in the Circle um, so if you can find a copy of that again the way I find these is through archive.org uh, which I never tire of um, telling people about and, and uh, think it's really awesome um, but it looks like my uh, time here is up so if you all have other comments and questions, send them in by email here. Um, get in touch with us about our clubs. If you want more um, uh, languages, more reading and writing, uh, let us know. Uh, and so for next time, it will be Rosemary Sutcliffe's The Sword and the Circle first of her three King Arthur books that we'll be reading over the next few months here. Uh, again, this has been Signum Academy on Twitch. Thanks so much for uh, all your attention uh, and happy reading. See you all next time.